श्री राम बहादुर राय चैंसलर स्टेट यूनिवर्सिटी प्रोफेसर दिनेश सिंह फॉर्म वाइस चैंसलर दिल्ली यूनिवर्सिटी डिस्टिंग गेस्ट लेडीज एंड जेंटलमैन वेरी गुड इवनिंग टू ऑल ऑफ यू व्हेन आई केव हियर being accompanied by Ram Bahadur Rai ji and Professor Dinesh Singh I found a lot of people are waiting outside because the accommodation in the hall is limited now I understand Professor Singh how and why these people are waiting outside Because the new you are going to introduce the subject, and in the magnificent way you have introduced the subject, that I hardly need anything to add to redefine education in our context of India. I will just start my observation with a personal anecdote, which kindled my deep interests, particularly on higher education. When I entered the office of the president as thirteenth president of the republic, I came to. no which i did not know even being long years almost quarter of a century in the cabinet of the union government under various prime ministers starting from indira gandhi and ending with dr manmohan singh i am candidly admitting that i did not have that much knowledge that president of india in his ex officio capacity is chancellor of more than 130 central institutions of which about 48 are central universities naturally lot of invitations came from different institutions to address them on their convocations <coughs> and referring to my interaction with the director of one of the iits it was the first batch of iits established by pandit nehru at the advent of the second five year plan when through the mohalla navis planning model emphasis was given on making india fast industrialized i am talking of the mid 50s and early 60s so nehru recognized that there is need of having capable technical persons having knowledge and also practical wisdom to implement and convert the knowledge for the benefit of society to so one such iit i was invited and after the formalities were over convert convocation address was delivered then i had interaction with director and some of the senior faculty members along with the director over a cup of tea i asked mr director what is the campus recruitment he said sir more than enough if i had more capacity i could have 
given more jobs to bright young men and women. Then, second question I asked, and then he went on saying, elaborating the point, that almost every part of the world, graduates of that IITs, are running the important multinational organizations, being in very top positions. Listening to that, then my second question to him was, could you tell me how many of them are staying in your country, in our country, and joining institutes like yours. His reply was, I don't have the exact figure. You know, don't bother about it, I will find out. But I want to know. He said, hardly any. Then I put the third question to him. Mr. Director, do we require spending the scarce resources of the country over creating the institutions just to promote the cell promotion of a product like a detergent? produced by a multilateral, multinational companies? Do you require the qualifications of an IIT graduate? He said, sir, I get your point. Well, no, you carry on your activities. You are highly satisfied with your performance. But this gives me the hint what is my duty for the next five years. It was in the very first few months of the first year of my presidency as 13th President of the Republic. Professor Dinesh Singh will be added out and thereafter almost like a parrot. It was my repetition of the same point on improving the coalition, quali qualification, qualities, on raising the standards of the higher education in our country. I used to ponder over, had discussions with HRD ministries, ministers, senior officials, vice chancellors, institutionalized a conference of the directors of IITs, NITs, IISERs, scores of management institutions, and Central University Vice Chancellors. When I used to meet a newly appointed governor of a state <coughs> who normally used to come and pay a courtesy call to the president, who is technically appointing authority, but not virtually, because president, as per amended Article 74 of the Constitution, while discharging his duties and responsibility, president is to discharge his responsibility as per the advice of the Council of Ministers. From 19 50, 26 January to the October 1974, these words were not in the Article 74 of the Indian Constitution. These were the contributions of the 42nd Amendment. But that's besides the point, I'm just making a casual reference to it. Why I say that it is virtual appointment but not real appointment real appointing authority. 
I gave him a copy of the Constitution. And it is well read. You are supposed to know it. But what I find from the reports which I received from the various governors, that sometimes they forget what is their role which has been defined in the Constitution. And also told them that one system which I have introduced and I have intention to continue it, institutionalize the conference, annual conference of the vice chancellors of central universities and directors of the institutions of which I am ex officio. Chairman, visitor, or chancellor. Designations vary. Similar to the universities, and their numbers are much more. Right now, when I am speaking before you, there are more than 760 universities, and surely the information when I got by this time, it has been added by a few number <laughs> and more than 40,000 colleges. <clears throat> and the second one which I pondered and continued to repeat like parrot in all educational congregations, how is it that the country despite its difficulties in different phases Almost 1,500 years from the days of Taxila, Takshashila, in 3rd century BC to 12th century AD, destruction of Nalanda. 1,500 years the scholars, students, teachers were attracted like magnet in universities, centers of excellence in India. And today, every year, how many thousands of bright students after at the graduation stage or at the post-graduation stage goes abroad, leave the country. And all of them do not come back. It's good that they are being settled there. I do not consider it as brain drainage, but I consider it as some sort of we are supplying the brains to the growing society on the international level. But at the same time, we shall have to keep in mind that charity begins at home. We must require the intelligent, well-qualified, well-articulated, well-disciplined young men and women to build this nation. And my concept of nation is not confined to any narrow vision. My concept of nation is when I think of India, I do not just think of a territorial limit which has been defined in Indian Constitution in Schedule 1, Territory of India. In my younger days, when the education system was controlled by the imperial rulers, when I used to draw the map of India, that is my impression of India, but recognizing political reality, excluding Pakistan and Bangladesh territories. Right now, 1.32 billion people occupy the territories which is defined in Article 1, Schedule 1 of Indian Constitution. 
which is 3.3 million square kilometers, which consists of seven religions, practiced everyday life, which consists of 120 dialects, 120 languages, 1600 dialects are being used in their daily lives. That is the concept of my nation. The concept which European <laughs> countries adopted after the series of treaties of Westphalia in 1645, a defined territory having a common language, more or less adhering to a common religion and also identifying an enemy. In India, I cannot. I am not talking I should not, I cannot identify an enemy. Since 5,000 years ago, up to the days of 1920 when Rabindranath Tagore and Mahatma Gandhi established Vishwa Bharati and Gujarat Vidyapit. They have taught us Yatra Vishwa Bhavate Kodiram. Whole universe is settled here, has made its nest here. We start our prayer by observing Sarvesh Ukhina Bhavantu, Sarvesh Antu Nirama. Total inclusiveness, no exclusivity. Therefore, as Professor Sina, while introducing this subject, in a very magnificent manner, drew our attention to some of the very salient features. Professor Singh has very clearly mentioned how knowledge systems were used to aid the country, its economy, over several centuries. So what is the challenge for us in India today? Somewhere where perhaps India owing to various partnerships external particularity in the 19th century lost its moorings in large measures. Yet, the ever resilient spirit of India refuses to get suppressed and strives nobly and with vigor. This is also evidenced by the strivings of many great souls from the start of the 20th century. Prominent among them were Tagore, Mahatma Gandhi, who were concerned about the lack of educational institutions that were suited to India's needs and to give utterance to, as Jawaharlal Nehru put out, it's his whole quote unquote. Though Tagore and Gandhi had slightly different approaches, the similarities in their philosophies and practices were striking. Both gave the expression to their ideas in the form of institutions when Tagore set up at Shantiniketan and Mahatma Gandhi, Gujarat with the beat and Kashi with the beat. During the lifetime of Tagore, he made it almost prohibited that no fund will be received from the government. It must be run by the charity and contributions from the people. Fortunately, Gujarat Vidyapit is still maintaining that tradition. 
though after the assassination of Mahatma Gandhi in 1948, his chancellor vested in Moral Jidyashar, who was an important cog in the parliamentary system of India, either as finance minister of Maharashtra, not Maharashtra, then Bombay presidency, then chief minister, and then central minister, and finally prime minister, but did not have the temptation to take a cover from the treasury. Such a discipline was restored and it was developed. Of course, I do not think that it is essential in today's context. What is more important that the aid must be without any baggage. <clears throat> when Nalanda and Vikram Shida were totally supported by the state revenues from the allocated villages surrounding the universities, there were no stings. In what direction universities will go? will learn, will exchange views. Universities are expected to be the ground of cross-fertilization of ideas. Taxila was the conference of four civilizations, Greek, Persian, Indian, Chinese. All universities, if it is worth the name of the university, it must have no barrier in the process of thought. <laughs> Truly, when Mao Zedong used the phrase, I do not know what was in his mind, but the phrase is associated with his name in the days of cultural revolution. Late hundred flowers bosom, hundred schools of thought contained. But in a limited way, I do feel every university must have hundred thoughts, hundred schools of thought, thousands of flowers, independent. Each one of them has its own beauty and cannot be generalized. Given the needs and challenges, India cannot afford to lose direction, nor can it afford to go astray as we are in a race against time. India's challenges stem from its need to harness the energies of its teeming millions in a very young age group and give them direction. India can and should strive to use this young population pool to not just stay competitive in a globalized world, but also set the peace of growth and development as it did in the past. Some of the challenges have been highlighted by Professor Singh very eloquently and I do not want to repeat it. However, I do wish to draw on my own experience and learning throughout my career to add to them. In such a situation, the role of the state becomes critical. No agency can hope to replace the strength of the state when it comes to the question of providing resources and legislative support. No doubt, much of what we have seen over the years up to the present, which can be deemed as positive and productive, owes a great deal to the support of the state. However, 
what is paramount importance is to create an environment where some of the mistakes in the past can be pruned away and the good and positive achievements can be further strengthened and supplemented let me illustrate illustrate how state intervention and support in the realm of education leads to the benefits for society in the 80s the late M. G. <coughs> Ramchandran, 80s of the last century, as the Chief Minister of Tamil Nadu, launched the midday meal scheme for school students in state-run schools of Tamil Nadu. One of the direct and the lasting benefits of that scheme has been the increase in a sustained manner. in the enrollment ratio for the school children of tamil nadu leading to a very high literacy rates particularly for girls in turn this has led to a significant drop in the population growth rate of tamil nadu the scheme at its inception was responsible for over 65 lakh children being fed nutritious meals and the reduction in number of children suffering from malnutrition corresponded with an increase in the number of children going to school the success of the mid day meal scheme as implemented by the union government is a testament to the vision of mgr who was the first successfully to run such a program let there be no doubts such a program can readily be sustained and supported by the state i would also like to state interventions to be of such nature and there are many more such instances on the other hand there are other instances where state interventions can be counterproductive and perhaps it would be useful to dwell upon some of the points in this regard I concur with Professor Dinesh Singh that there does not seem to be much evidence in India's past or in the modern history of some of the advanced nations that could seem to suggest that state policy and engenders the great educational institutions beyond the point. At least not if the policy results in micromanagement. So one must realize. that do nalanda and vikramshila which i have stated earlier did depend on the resources of the state as have our iits nits and many other institutions but they were largely left to their own devices in terms of their direction and growth this is also the case with many of the celebrated institutions in other advanced countries distinguished guests ladies and gentlemen there is another matter on which i wish to dwell a little as it happens the president of india as i mentioned to you serves as ex officio in ex officio capacity of the large number of universities etc the short point which i want to drive at what i advise the governor i may not continue to be the president but i think they should follow the practice as the incumbent president and the successive presidents should follow the practice of annualizing the conference of vice chancellors directors and high education officials not only to enlarge their own knowledge and experience but also to have the inputs in the state craft from the persons who are knowledgeable as dr singh was very categorically mentioning the university from where i come my alma mater calcutta university i had a chair i mean the university had a chair 
for the basic research in physics. The chair was projected, project, uh, <coughs> given, donated by a rich man of Gujarat, rich industrialist, whose surname was Khaira. It is known as Professor Khaira or Khaira Professor. Dr. C. V. Raman in 1930 was appointed as Khaira Professor and doing the basic research work till today. After 1930, today is 2019. 89 years, no Indian scholar working in Indian University have received Nobel Prize for his original work. There is no lack of talent either in the faculty nor in the teachers. In the last 15 years, one and a half decade, four Indian scholars received Nobel Prize in different fields, including economics by Amartya Sen. Amartya Sen, Hargobind Khurana, Professor Chandrasekhar, all of them are products of the Indian universities. But they did not get the ambient, conducive atmosphere to carry on their projects, pursue their knowledge, studies, what is needed today if we want to meet the challenges of this century to create that ambient, to create that atmosphere. I'm sorry, I'm exceeding my time much. And I would like to be excused as I started my observations by saying, almost like parrot, I am repeating these words and perhaps I will continue to repeat it unless I find in the least published every year by time, time education, selection list of top universities of the world, I find a dozen of Indian universities and institutions find their place in these lists of outstanding universities, outstanding universities, institutions, worldwide recognized. Unless I see this topic of going Indian students for learning, postgraduate, appreciate. But it should create the facilities. As I started, as I said in my speech, I don't mind the traveling of knowledge. I do not describe it as brain drain, brain supply where it is needed. We are really emerging as a globalized village. One world is no longer a dream which some people dreamt after the First World War. Wendell Wilkie was one of them and he brought out his thesis as one world and expected that all the League of Nations will be the model of one world. Neither League of Nations or its successor United Nations of our organization have been able to do it, but truly it is emerging world as a global village. If we want to be a citizen of that global village, let us prepare ourselves for that and therefore, we shall have to redefine aims of education. We shall have to create the ambient for our research, for our innovators, for our scholars to pursue their studies in their own way, uninterrupted, unhindered. Scholars, it is for him to decide Nobody else on which way 
he will move. In which way he can serve the social purpose? He is the best to determine in what way he can serve social purpose through his work. No dictation from outside. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Joy him. And again, I regret I have taken a little longer time than I intended to have. Thank you. And thank you, Professor Singh, for your wonderful presentation, which have mesmerized the entire hall and the entire audience. Thank you.